Shut up and sit down. All right, this week on the podcast, we talk some more filming with Caleb Copeland of Copeland Creative. He also has the Redneck Tech podcast. Now, if you guys are doing any sort of filming or uh, want to but don't know how to begin or want to take your uh, content to the next level, you definitely need to stop right now and check out the Redneck Tech Podcast. Uh, Caleb works with some of the biggest names in the industry, and he started the podcast basically to get information out to guys that he couldn't find when he was starting out. And uh, things have changed a little bit since that time, uh, but I guarantee that you're going to find something helpful in every single episode we talk tips and tricks and in some sort of um, production tips for uh, guys starting out guys trying to elevate their content in this podcast um, but we also have um, you know he, he's got uh, some stories and uh, some experiences that he shares with us that are just uh, just great and things that you know most guys aren't going to be able to to do he's he's had some really cool experiences so it's been a great podcast um and and it's i I know you guys are gonna love it so um first a little bit of housekeeping gotta give a big shout out to our latest patreons luke benner and jerry casperson you know thanks so much for helping up the show uh anybody not familiar or just checking out the podcast for the first time uh but not familiar with our patreon patreon is like a crowdfunding for creators so it's like an auto draft that supports um the podcast uh, for things like hosting, production, equipment, gear, travel, so we can provide the best possible content for you guys. And then to give back, we have a quarterly giveaway um, where we give away some great prizes. Um, and we also have a, like a, a private Facebook group where uh, like we're going to be going live from ATA, and um, so just kind of people can follow along with what we're doing and um, it's going to be our beta testing for um, getting back into the video podcasting and uh, live streaming Um, but yeah we do quarterly giveaways Uh, this quarter you know for the end of the year right after the first of the year we're giving away a full uh, everything you need to do to saddle hunt so we're giving away a full uh, trophy line ambush pro setup as well as some muddy pro sticks and an out of Uh, artisan outdoor fabrication uh, platform Um, so besides supporting the show basically um, you're buying yourself a raffle ticket for some pretty awesome prizes Um, so if you guys are interested in that you can check that out at patreon.com forward slash bowhunter chronicles podcast sign up help us out Uh, you know it's uh, you know about the cost of a cup of coffee uh, once every month so uh, it really helps us out and uh you know, you get to get a chance to win some great prizes. But if that's not your thing, don't worry about it. The only thing that we ask is that you tell somebody else about the podcast. So, um, you know, we're trying to reach as many people as possible um, to get our information out there. And if you tell somebody else, you know, about a podcast that you liked or, um, you know, information that you found helpful, uh, maybe turn somebody else on to the podcast and then um, rate us. So give us a a five-star review or whatever you think we rate on whatever platform it is you're listening to. And then if you really like the podcast, or I guess if you really hate the podcast, take the time and write out a review uh, because that helps us kind of moves us up in the algorithm and gets us in front of more people that way. Um, And, you know, as always follow along with us on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, you know, our YouTube. And I know you're going to love this podcast. It's, it's a great one. I really enjoyed it. And Thanks, as always, for the support. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Adam and John back with another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast. Today, we are going to be talking um, to a a character here who wears a lot of hats. So, um, Caleb Copeland, Copeland Creative, Redneck Tech Podcast, uh, he does filming, he does podcasts, and uh, apparently he's he's telling me this is the only thing he's good at talking about is uh, <laughs> filming and podcasting and, and putting out content. So uh, how are you doing tonight, Caleb? I'm good, man. I'm actually packing up to go on my last trip of the year, thank the Lord. I've been gone like 160-something days this year, and i got one more trip, and then it's home until... January till 2020 so I'm pretty stoked about that 
That is crazy. So, um, I want to get into your background, like as far as like hunting and like how you came up hunting and then, uh, the transition into filming. But then also, I mean, with that, you know, we see guys in the, the hunting industry and it seems like everybody that we talk to rarely gets time to hunt anymore because they spend so much time working. And so, so how has that transition been as well? Yeah, well, um, I started uh, to start way back. Uh, you know, I was told, I don't remember this because I was so little, I was 18 months old sitting at the base of a tree with my dad when he killed a little basket rack eight point um, when I was really little. And I guess from then on, it was, you know, that's all she wrote. You know, I, I grew up hunting. That's all. I, was, I played baseball in college and hunted. Those are the only two things I've ever been good at in my life was playing baseball and hunting. And I wanted to make a career out of one of them. And luckily, hunting turned out to be the one that I got to make a career out of. Um, I was the I was just like most guys as I watched all. I mean, you know, back back you know, 15 years ago, all there was was Outdoor Channel and Sportsman's Channel. So I spent most of my time when I wasn't on the baseball field watching hunting or hunting myself. And just like every other guy, I wanted to be Michael Waddell. And I I learned real quick that. Uh, the money was not in front of the camera. It was behind the camera. And I always had a face for radio. I never was, uh, you know, some, I, I, and, and the reason that most guys can't ever be what Michael Waddell is because there's only one Michael Waddell. You know, there's only one T-Bone Turner. There's only one Pigman. There's only one, you know, Lee and Tiffany. You know, that's why they have been successful is because they are these larger-than-life personalities that can never be replicated. And uh, I, I learned how to... Be, try and be the guy behind the camera to make that personality even better, to try and produce content and produce series and films and television shows with those type people to make them better. Um, but to, to, uh, to go back a little bit, you know, I was in college um, and my brother won a contest that I actually signed him up for in Field and Stream Magazine. Uh, they were looking for uh, the next generation essentially to foster younger kids into hunting and fishing and they were going to be on a television show called uh, Outdoor Icons but you had to be under the age of 18 to sign up for this well he was 17 at the time I was 21 so I signed him up I wrote the story of his first hunt because I was there and uh, lo and behold he wins and with winning this he got to do a turkey hunt with real tree he got to tour real tree farms he got to be on the television show Outdoor Icons that was on the Outdoor Channel at the time. This was 2000 and 2008, 2009, something like that. And I got to go with him on some of the stuff, essentially kind of as almost a chaperone type deal. And uh, I got to see how a television show was made. I got to see, you know, what uh, freelance videographers did, you know, how they made their money, how they marketed themselves. And, you know, granted, I'm in college at the time, and I'm like, holy crap, this is something I could... I could do, you I mean, I could travel around and hunt and, and, you know, and several of us told them or several of those guys told us, and like, you know, you're not going to make tons of money, but you're going to get to see and do things that you would never get to, you know, see and do otherwise. And I'm like, well, I'm cool with that. You know, I'm all about the experiences, you know, the money's, money's great, but, um, I'd rather go and see and do all these things. So, um, I wanted, I took my brother's, you know, with, with his winning, he had to do video blogs for the website well I would produce his video blogs with what little knowledge I had because I was the only technically savvy person in my family and um, I'd put music to it and edited a little bit in iMovie on my iMac at the time and uh, after his tenure was over with them they asked him to stay on because he had done so much you know more work than all the other kids and he's like I didn't do any of that my brother did so they hired me to produce a web series for him and you know I'm 22 at the time 21 and uh, I'm now getting paid produce a web series that I have no clue how to actually do and uh, they paid me $5,000 and I took 2500 of that and went and bought my first HD camera it was a Canon XHA1 and I produced their series, they never aired any of them but I didn't care, I got paid and I took the next three and a half years and I just filmed whoever would let me go with them I would, for free, you know I didn't charge anything, I would just go and sit in tree stands with people, go to turkey blinds with people I just wanted to gain experience. I wanted to meet people. I wanted to network. And um, 
see if this is something I can actually do. And the whole time I was working as an uh, IT technician right out of college and uh, just essentially clearing, you know, clearing viruses off old ladies' computers and working in small businesses and, you know, hooking up routers and stuff like that. And, you know, it was never, you know, hugely technical, but I had a business degree. And it was the only job I could get is right after the recession. And uh, I had an idea for a hunting show one night watching. It was like Swamp Loggers. I can't remember that exact show, but anyway, I knew Jeff Foxworthy, believe it or not, through a friend of a friend of a friend. And I wrote him an email, right, outlined the idea, because I knew he was a big hunter, outlined the idea, sent it to him, and lo and behold, he, email, he emails me back like a day or two later and says, I love this idea. Do you care if I pitch this to somebody? And I said, no, man, go for it. So a couple of days later, my old boss calls me and uh, his name's Mark Womack, and he called, and I, I knew who he was because I had watched every show he had probably ever produced. And uh, he said, I'm, you know, my job as a producer is to poke holes and stuff like this. And he's like, I can't poke holes in this one. He's like, you, you care if we film a pilot for this? I was like, yeah. I was like, as long as I can be involved somehow. And uh, ended up the pilot became Fox Really Outdoors. I got hired to produce it. I was clueless, thought I knew what I was doing. And uh, I started working at Sub 7. This was... 2011, 12, January 2012, I don't remember, 11 or 12, and uh, I was there for five and a half years, or no, five years, and uh, I got to work on some of the biggest shows in the outdoor industry, work with absolutely the best guys in the business, learned more there in three months of working with professionals than I did in three and a half years of doing it on my own, Uh, and almost three years ago, I left and started my own business, Copeland Creative, and never looked back and I've now I'm busier than I've ever been and finally making some good money. So I'm here and here we are. And so the, the name Copeland creative, what is a creative? Like, so I I didn't even, I've, I've heard that as a, a a noun, as a, as a thing, not a verb, like a being creative. Um, and, and so it wasn't until maybe like last year when I was like, Oh, that's actually like a, a thing, like a, like a noun. <laughs> so what, yeah. what is it? You know, I mean, we hear the, we hear that word used quite a bit, but. Well, essentially, essentially what we are is an agency that takes, um, takes clients and we take their brands, their names, their products, and we creatively put, you know, we creatively create content around them. Um, you know, the creative is either, you can either see it as the creativity behind what we do or the creative in actually creating something. Um, so it kind of has a double meaning. It, essentially, it's kind of a creative collective where we're using, you know, essentially our, you know, our, you know, our, our God-given creative gifts of making content, making series, making films, making commercials, product videos. Um, and we're using that to facilitate what companies need to produce products and series. You know, I mean... I don't really know a better way to explain it. I've never been asked that question, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, that's what I'm here. I'm here to break down all the barriers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, though. I like it. And so um, and so, you've been doing that for uh, a couple of years, and then how long have you been doing the podcast, and what, what podcast is it that you're doing? Yeah, I started the podcast in November two years ago, so it's been just, just over – you know, I started November 1st, two years ago, so it's been just over two years, and uh, the podcast is called Redneck Tech Podcast, and it's everywhere you get podcasts, I guess, and um, essentially what I wanted to do is uh, that three and a half years that I spent working and trying to figure out how to break into the industry and essentially got lucky, um, it was a really hard road, um, which we didn't have the social media that we did, you know, that we do now, we didn't have the access to um, these different producers and production companies and television shows and web series is that we do now. And essentially, I, I you know, I, I reached out to people. I asked questions. I did all the right things. And I just never got responses. I never got answers. I never, it was essentially when I was trying to get in the industry, it was like, unless you knew someone, you were screwed. You're not getting in this industry. You know, it's kind of like a, you know, a boys club to where, you know, it's kind of members only type deal. And I wanted to kind of 
break down that barrier and try and get this information because it's not rocket science. And that's one thing I learned is I thought there was, you know, these guys knew something and I didn't. And that's not the case. I tell people all the time, if I can do this job, anybody can do this job. You know, it's one of those deals to where none of this is rocket science. It's all, it, it's so much more about knowing the basics because you can teach a monkey how to run a camera. It's learning how to actually produce, how to edit, not just how to edit, not not just how to use the program, but actually how to tell a story within a timeline. And then it's doing all the little things right, being a good communicator, you know, answering the phone when people call, calling people back, being a nice human being, always being positive, being the guy in camp that people want to come back because I don't care how talented you are. If you're the guy that's causing problems in camp, if you're a negative person, I don't care. You're not getting called back. And so I, I feel like I'm, I'm not the best producer, I'm not the best editor, I'm not the best photographer, I'm not the best any of those things. But I am a guy that it can go into a camp, can be positive, can get along with just about anybody, and, um, and I work hard, and I answer my phone. So I do all the little things right. So I think that's why I've been as successful as we have been, and we're still growing, so I can't complain about that. And we talked about this a little bit before the podcast, and uh, I just want you kind of to elaborate on it a little bit. Um, you know, for the listener, you know, like I found out, you know, from, you know, some of my other friends that do podcasts and that create content, et cetera, and they're like, you got to check out this Redneck Tech podcast. And Redneck Tech, to me, is like what John does, <laughs> which is... That's that's Redneck Engineering. <laughs> well, but you know, that, I mean, so if you can Redneck Engineer something, I'm just thinking it from the, you know, the, the, the creative side, from the, from the, okay, so this is, this is what John does, but we're going to do it with cameras and, and video and all that stuff. So I thought it was going to be like high, do, you know, high dollar problems and low dollar solutions. And the first yeah. podcast that I listened to, I was like, hell yeah, let's listen to this cameras. And the first like words out of your mouth after the intro was like, if you got like a $1,500 budget, I can't help you out. And I was like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> like, what the <laughs> hell? So Yeah, I've broken a lot of guys' hearts with that one. <laughs> but, but so kind of, I mean, it, but the thing is, is that the content, like the information that's there has kept me coming back and like saying, okay, what, what else you got? What else you got? Because I feel like it's really um, helpful information so like with that redneck tech well, I mean what are we what are we talking about here so you know redneck tech I told you earlier that you know I came up with a name because North Georgia uh, Technical College is right up here in uh, uh, Clarksville which is just north of me and everybody around here calls it redneck tech because essentially everybody goes there to get HVAC certificates and welding license or welding certificates and uh, it's essentially a trade school, and it's just kind of known here around as Redneck Tech. And I figured, you know, I'm a redneck, honestly, you know, and it's in the bio of uh, it's in the bio of the Redneck Tech Instagram. It's like I'm a redneck that found out how to make a, a hobby my job, and that's essentially what I did. Is um, I am I'm a true blue through and through redneck from North Georgia that grew up um, hunting and fishing and doing all that crap. And I was like, you know, I, I kind of want to make a living of this, so. Essentially, I, t- I found, I understood the technical side of it, that I understood the technical side of that, and I kind of married the two. Um, essentially, that's what redneck tech is to me, is uh, taking a redneck and kind of showing him the, how you can use the technology to create content. And, you know, if you want to, it's you can create content that's good for you, or you can create content that can hopefully make you some money. With that, like some of the top topics that are on the podcast, like let's just break down. Like, so I would say our listenership is either already creating content and ready to either take it to a company or take it to the next level, or they're just starting out doing their self filming and, um, you know, trying to produce something that's like quality, not just for to share with their family, but to try to put on YouTube and try to put together something that's not the 30 seconds of, you know, you shoot the deer and it it runs off and, you know, just for shot placement type type. Yeah. They're wanting, they're wanting to create something people will watch. Right. And so what information would you have for them? Or like, where would you tell people to start? And then kind of like from, from the beginning. So let's say they, 
they already have any camera and you know they they're they're familiar with editing what what should they be doing versus just going out and like we were talking about prior to the podcast just filming filming your hunt the the first thing they need to do is they need to figure out what their goal is you you know i ask you know i get questions about all the time what camera should i buy what uh, lens should i buy what this that and the other and that all goes in the first thing i ask is what's your budget and when they give me a budget the second thing i ask is what's your goal and most guys don't know what that goal is. And when I ask you what your goal is, when I ask you what your purpose is, is are you filming uh, a web series that you're wanting to get sponsor dollars? Are you filming a web series that you just want to try and get some free gear and some hunts? Are you doing a YouTube series that you can show all your buddies? Are you a freelance videographer that is out there selling yourself to try and get you know, day rates to go out and film other shows? Uh, are you trying to create a film for the Badlands Film Festival? You know, what is your goal? And if your goal is just to go out there and hang out with your buddies and film hunts, then that's easy. You know, that doesn't really take a whole lot of planning and error time and effort. But if you're going out there to try and, so let's just say let's, we're going to create a film for Badlands Film Festival and you're going to do it about your whitetail season. Okay, well, that's your that's your goal. I want to th- create a film for Badlands Film Festival about my whitetail season. Okay, now we have a reason, we have a purpose, we have a goal. Okay, now how do we make how do we meet that goal? We have to sit down and do what we call pre-production. We have to sit down. And we have to write out. Okay, what's the story we're going to tell? Or is it about a specific deer? Is it about a specific farm? Is it about a specific state? Is it about hunting with your buddy, your dad, your brother, your uncle, your cousin? What what is the story that we're telling? Okay, now that we know what the story is that we're telling, now we have to break that down. How do we tell that story? What shots do we need to get? How do we go about filming this film? for Badlands Film Festival with a purpose. Because every time we pick up a camera, every time we pick up a your DSLR, your big camera, you need to be going out there with a shot list or a an idea of what those things are to meet that goal. Because if you're just going out and you're filming hunts and you're coming back and you're dumping cards every day, that there's no reason for that. If 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 you were there to film a film, you're not meeting your goal because once you once you finally kill that deer or don't kill that deer, what else do you have other than sitting in a deer stand? Nothing. And, you know, have you ever seen a film or, you know, a, look at any film, any television show, any anything worth watching that's ever been created. Did it all take place with one character in one place and they, you know, they, they no, nothing ever happens in a, you know, in a vacuum. There's there's so many more things that have to happen to create a good story. Think about every good story you've ever told your buddies. Did it all happen in one place? Did it all happen, you know, did it, it didn't encompass that five seconds that you shot the deer. There's so much more to it than that. So that's what you have to do. The main thing is you have to go about it with a purpose. And then the second thing that I feel like is the most important is once you know that goal is you have to know your camera, your gear backwards and forwards. Because if you are not confident in the gear that you're running, then you are not being the best producer that you can be. You're not being the best cameraman that you can be because if you're worried about, am I exposed correctly? Um, am, you know, does, how's my depth of field look? You know, how's my audio? You know, is that framed right? Is that in focus? Um, you know, if you're worried about those things while you're filming something, then you're not listening. You're not paying attention. You're not creating a good story. You're not getting all the nuances of that hunt because you're worried about your gear. You need to know your camera, your camera arm, your tripod, your head, your mics. You need to know what every button does, what those buttons mean, how they work together. That way, that when running that camera becomes second nature, then you can go and create cool content. That's the first two things you need to do. And then the third thing you need to do is if you don't know how to edit or not at least familiar with the editing process, you need to learn it. Because if you learn that, that is going to make you 10 times the shooter that you've ever been because now you understand the process of editing and you're not going to what I call vomit through the lens essentially film every single little thing because you know what you need and you know what you don't need it's going to make your life so much easier I promise okay so for the listener and even for myself like I'm like I'm like right now like I'm overwhelmed like (laughs) I'm like holy shit like 
that was <laughs> like and and that's why um why the podcast is so great is because there's an episode for you know each. or or five episodes for for each one of those yeah. um cuz i'm just yeah. uh, so oh, go ahead well to break it down simply the three things is first of all you need to make a goal create that goal what is the goal the second thing is you need to learn your camera backwards and forwards and be confident in it be confident in your abilities with it and the third thing is you need to at least learn the editing process you don't have to learn how to edit but at least learn how things go in a timeline and why shots why shots you get are important and why shots you're you know that aren't getting used aren't important so those are the three things the goal learn your camera learn to edit and so I want to uh, maybe throw you a curveball, but I think it's going to be something that, you know. I'll bring you, it, dude. I love I love hitting curveballs. Uh, so that was my favorite thing to hit in, in college. So um, with that, you know, you talk about what shots to use. And, and I know that I've heard you talk on the podcast, but I don't think I've ever heard it or, you know, found it on there is like a shot list of things that you need to have. And I'd imagine that that's different, you know, whether you're filming an elk hunt, a uh, a Rambo bike yep. commercial or a yep. whitetail hunt or a turkey hunt. But yep. I want to know um, maybe an example of uh, uh, a shoot that you've had where, um, like, because I heard you say like on one of your last podcasts that, you know, it, it, when you were referring to your Badlands um, film that you're filming or, or not, w- whichever you decide to do with it, um, that you've done, a lot more with less. So like, let's say that you don't have those shots or maybe you don't have all the shots to tell your story, but you know what you want the story to look like. How do you like creatively, you know, is there an example where, you know, maybe you were either given somebody else's footage to edit and it was missing something and you turned it into something great or where you missed a couple shots and either had to go back and fill in the story um, you know, doing more with less, I guess. Yep. There's, there's a couple of different answers to that. So, um, I, I, I did a podcast not too, too long ago where we actually went over shot lists and stuff. And actually, I think I posted, I'm pretty sure I did. If I didn't, I need to go back and do it where I actually posted a generic shot list, um, or, or, uh, put it on the website. I don't remember what I did, but essentially I have a generic shot list for like a white tail hunt, a turkey hunt, essentially breaking down each, you know, the absolute basics of the shots. But there's a couple things you can do. And most of the time, this is going to happen when I'm editing something that I didn't shoot, which I hate doing. I detest editing things that I didn't shoot because I know when I go in the field, I'm going to get everything I need. And if I didn't get something, then I know how to fix it. But most of the time, and this is what happens in 90% of television shows, episodes, um, pieces of content that are out there right now, is when... People don't do a good job in the field of getting all the shots that they need. They use interviews or voiceover or graphics as a crutch. Essentially, they go and they they shoot tons and tons of interviews. And I I got a couple shows in mind. I'm not going to call people (laughs) off because I'm friends with people that produce them. But anyway, um, they essentially they go back to a, a a studio. They go out and they film hunts. Is all they do. And they go back to the studio and they film an inordinate amount of interviews, just tons and tons of interviews. And then all you do is you, what you're doing is what I call a B roll show as you just put those interviews in a timeline and lay the B roll that they're talking about over the top of them. You're letting the interviewer or the interviewee tell the story. And then you're taking all the B roll shots from the hunt and just laying it over when he's talking about it. And that is by far the easiest way to edit and shoot something. Is it the best way? Absolutely not. And then the other way is what we call the montage with the voiceover. Essentially, it's a montage of shots, and there's some voiceover actor or um, whoever the show is, you know, the host of the show, voiceovering what's happening. Instead of telling me in the field when it's happening, they're telling you in voiceover when it's happening. Pretty much every film I've ever seen in the outdoor industry is produced this way because it's so easy to do. You go out and you make a bunch of pretty shots, you put them to pretty music, and then you have somebody voice over it. Well, that's not hard. Any, I mean, that anybody can do that. That's why you have to do a good job in pre-production to get all those things while you're in the field. Create the content while you're in the field. Get the dialogue in the field. Um, and then the other way that you can do it is um, 
is you have to be really creative. And I mean, like, for instance, you know, there's been times that we've gotten back from trips where we didn't have a cutaway shot. And when I say cutaway, like we needed, we needed one shot to get from a turkey coming in and we needed a sh- tight shot of somebody on the shotgun. And then that way we can cut back to the turkey. Say there's a really long gap where the turkey stood there for a long time. Well, we can't, we don't want to jump cut that. And maybe you don't understand what a jump cut is, but essentially it's a cut in the middle of a long sequence where it jumps from one part of the sequence to another, and there's a time, you know, a gap of time there. Well, in, instead of jump cutting and cutting out that gap of time, we wanted a shot to cut to. So generally we, what we'll do is we'll go back and shoot cutaways. We'll shoot tights of the, the, the hunter on the gun, reaching his finger in the trigger guard, on the you know, flipping off safety, looking down the barrel of the gun, um, all those things like here he comes, you know, y'all ready, I'm going to shoot, you know, all those things that happened as that turkey was coming in, but we were focused on the turkey, not filming our hunter. So after the shot happens, we'll go back and we'll recreate those things. Well, you know, in the heat of the moment, sometimes, you know, it's happened a couple of times where we didn't get those cutaway shots in the moment, or it got really dark and we couldn't get them and we had to leave the next day. Well, what do we do? We go out in the woods behind our house, wait until the light gets correct, shoot them super tight, and you never know the difference. You're none the wiser. But, that's what that's what telling a good story takes. Most guys wouldn't do that because they think, well, I'm lying to the viewer. That's behind my house. That's not in Nebraska. Well, have you ever? I mean, have you ever watched a television show or a movie? Do you think those are real? <laughs> you know, this is inter- it's entertainment, and that's what people. That's what kills me when people don't believe in doing recreates or uh, cutaways or anything like that. I'm like, look, you're 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 creating this piece of content for people to watch it and to to enjoy it and to entertain it. All those things happened. The only thing that pretty much happened live was killing that animal. Everything else you created, either leading up to or after. So what's what's wrong with getting those shots after the fact and telling a better story than you did? And unless you have a, a GoPro going or a point of, you know, or a second cameraman, which is, you know, that's very, you know, that's not feasible for most people. You got to go back and get those cutaway shots because that makes you tell a better story. It and, and that allows you to speed that story up or slow that story down once you get an editing. It makes you know, it makes it better or worse. And that's when that's when I say all the time, if you get all those basic shots, you get the animal coming in, you get the shots of the hunter um seeing the animal come in, flipping off safety, finger on the trigger, kill the animal, recreates the you know the uh, recovery and I you know you 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 follow the generic shot list to a T, and you hand that to a decent editor he's going to have a good piece of content. Well, what sets a really good content piece uh, a really good piece of content apart from a great content or a great piece of content is all those all those shot list pieces you got creative with those. You did a better job of getting that dialogue. You did a better job of um, shooting that turkey coming in with a shallow depth of field and you got really cool tight shots. The lighting was great. Um, You did a really good job of shooting interviews or getting voiceover or whatever, you know, whatever lends itself to your film. You did a really good job of doing those things. And then you've met your shot list and then you hand it to an editor that can take those things and make them even better. That's when you have a great piece of content. You got to do the basics. And then once you meet the basics, you've got to be creative to do the rest of the stuff to make it that much better. So, um, you know, I, it's funny because I would think that most people that create content like today, right now, um, and not for TV or a film or anything like that, because I've, I've never really looked at it for, as a film perspective and like when you say like do you believe like a movie or a TV show is all shot in one day or it's all shot you know in this same sequence where they go back and do reshoots and things like that I've never really viewed it that way um, so it's really interesting you know to hear it put in that perspective as far as like recreates and and, and that um, but do you think that the the expectation has changed or the climate has changed um, since you started to now with the uh, oh, increase yeah. in, you know, like I said, YouTube, Vimeo, web shows, um, et cetera, versus, you know, from when you started? Oh, 100%. It's, it's, a, it's a completely different ball game. 
than when it was. And the biggest thing that I've noticed, well, two things. Biggest thing for me as a, as a business owner that makes my money doing this stuff is the timelines are shrinking. Um, we went from when we used to do television shows, you know, we'd shoot, you know, from say like Lee and Tiffany's show, we'd start filming middle of August and we wouldn't finish filming until middle of January. So there'd be 13 episodes shot in that, you know, August, uh, September, October, November, December, January. So in six months, we'd shoot 13 shows. Actually, we'd probably shoot more than that. But just for the sake of my argument, we're going to say 13, which is that's generally what people air. Okay, well, we wouldn't start editing on those shows until after they're all shot, pretty much. So that show that got shot in November is not going to air until July. Okay, so that's seven, eight months. That was the lead time. It was eight months from the time that was shot till now. Well, now, if you're not doing TV, which there's a lot of people that aren't doing TV, um, it's a week, two weeks, maybe. So we've shrunk our timeline from eight months to two weeks. And then you've got shows like Growing Deer TV with uh, uh, Dr. Grant Woods. He puts out a brand new show every Monday at 8 a.m., every week of the year, and he's been doing it for like nine years. So he puts out 52 shows a year, every Monday at 8 a.m., and they're all new and they're all semi-live. They happen the week before. Well, that is a really short timeline, and that is extremely hard to do. But now you've got these YouTube guys, you've got like the Born and Raised guys that are doing, you know, they shoot all of September and they start airing a show a day in November. That's a lot. But those shows are very different than a Lee and Tiffany, where they have a huge budget, a huge timeline, a big production company producing it, where you've got the Born and Raised guys that are, their shows don't have a lot of production value. In my opinion, they don't really have any at all. The the the, the lure to those shows are they are extremely, extremely relatable. All the people in those shows, everybody knows somebody like that in their life. Everybody has a buddy like that or a group of guys like that, and they can relate to exactly what those guys are doing. They're having a great time. They're hunting. They're doing it on, you know, majority of it's on public land. They're getting their butt kicked a lot. They're successful every now and then, and that's why people love it. Um, Up until this golden age of media, I don't think that show would have ever worked until now because of how people consume media now. You know, 60 or 70% of everything that's consumed now is through your phone. Um, and that's what's changed, is the timeline has changed and the medium in which we consume media has changed. In, in, the, in, in that vein, like, how does that, how do you react, like, to that with, you know, so I was told, like, when we started, we were going to start doing some video and stuff like that, um, is, like, kind of like what you said for, like the budget that we have or like whatever in my mind, like on some level, like I'm a perfectionist. Like I want it to be like, I know what I want it to look like, but getting it there and, you know, a a guy that produces a lot of content and, you know, he's like, look, you know, this is going to be seen on somebody's phone and they're going to, they're going to watch it, you know, one time. And it's like, if you get the same message across and you can have it, you know, and this is like, whether it's like a, you know, product review video or something like that. Like it doesn't have to have like all of this production, but it's like, you know, personally I feel like I can do better, but it's getting it out there and getting started and kind of like where you were when you started is, you know, getting that experience to know, to be familiar, to be able to do it. And now with this, the world, I I think maybe that's the, why the recreates are so, uh, such a, 50-50 50-50 type thing is because everything is like a vlog style in real time now versus... Right, like with the hunting public, born and raised, all the, you know, Insta stories, everything's kind of like, I mean, now, in your face right now. So so the production versus... Yeah. And, and so has that carried over, like, to you? Do you find yourself having to, like, find a compromise? Yeah, well, I do because of my clients now. Um, Dudley being the prime example. Um, Dudley, his what we what the content that I produce for Dudley is very much more born and raised style, and, and the reason is is because of his audience, what his audience expects, um, the volume of content that we're creating, 
you do not you, you just don't have time to create a really polished long form show like I'd like to with Dudley. And and I think even if if he if he wanted to, he could do a show as good or better than anybody on Outdoor Channel now. But that isn't his audience and that's not what his audience wants and and he's and even though I think he would do a good one, he's even better at what he does. It's really hard for me when I go with Dudley because it's so fast and we're moving so quickly to be able to do as good a job as I'd like to because I just don't have time to set up shots. I don't have time to manipulate lighting. I don't have time to do these things because we're hunting and then we're going to the next thing. We're going to the next thing. We're going to the next thing. We're running and gunning all the time. And Dudley's the only client I have that would shoot something off camera because getting a kill on camera is great, but it's not as important to him as telling the story of how we did it and how we're going to cook it, how we're going to cut it up, how we're going to all the other content that we're going to create with that animal. The kill's great, but I've been on, I don't even know how many hunts with Dudley now, and I've gotten him killing, like him shooting stuff like like a half a dozen times, and the times I've been with him, he's killed a lot more than a half a dozen animals. <laughs> and it's one of those things to where that frustrates the crap out of me because I want to be there when something happens. But he is there, and he is so, he's just, He's wide open all the time. It's like you get what you can get, and we move on to the next thing. Whereas every one of my other clients, they do not shoot until we have it on camera. Like, that is detrimental to the trip if we don't get a kill. Um, And I'm the one that calls that shot. I don't call that shot with Dudley because if we get it, great. If not, move on to the next one. You know, that kind of thing. And I think the reason is because he's got a YouTube channel He's got a social media following that moves extremely fast. I mean, he does usually two posts a day and, you know, five to ten stories. That's a lot. That's a lot. And that's so much different than what I'm used to. I'm used to being able to take five days to produce one whitetail kill, one story. And that's what I'm that's what I enjoy the most. And I feel like that's what I'm good at. And I've gotten a lot better at the at the YouTube style with Dudley just because I've had to, you know, it's one of those things is like sink or swim. And, um, and we enjoy working together and we work well together and we create some cool stuff, but that's not my style. Like I'm not a YouTube guy. I don't, I, I love what the born and raised guys are doing. I love what the hunt and public guys are doing. That is not the content that I like. I don't watch those. I've watched a couple of them. They're extremely too long, way too long for me and way too slow for me. <laughs> um, and I, I don't I don't like unpolished, and they're very very unpolished. But I understand why a lot of people do. They are my brother. That's all my brother watches. He watches the crap out of the hunting public. He watches the crap out of the um, born and raised guys and the primo everything Primos puts on there. Like he calls me all the time. Hey, did you see what so and so did? I'm like, no, Josh, I haven't. I'm sorry, I haven't. I haven't gotten to watch any of that because that's not the kind of con- and I think that's the beautiful thing about it is I think there's a place for all of it. Um, If it's up to me, I'm going to take extra time to make it pretty, to make it well-polished, to make it sound good, to look good, to make sure the kill's good, to make sure the lighting's good. I'm going to call somebody off a shot if the light's not good. I'm going to do all the things to make it look good because I'm putting a ton of time and effort into it. And that was one of the most frustrating things, and still is to this day, when you go in to create a film or a a series episode or a television show and you put on average when you do a television show there's three weeks of work in that episode there's usually a week of shooting it and two weeks of editing it so you've got 15 to 20 total days in 22 and a half minutes of content and the majority of people out there watching it are watching it for the two minutes that something was shot in it and that's really hard as a producer and as an editor to swallow when you've taken essentially three weeks and somebody only cares about two, one or two minutes of it. And But at the same time, and like you said, they'll watch it one time. Unless it's something just completely epic, they're going to watch it one time, they might say something to somebody about it, and then they're going to move on to the next one. And that's really, really disheartening. Well... Outside of the fact that, you know, like you said about Born and Raised, that everybody knows somebody that's like that or whatever, and that the allure, 
um, the hunting public the same. Uh, personally, I feel like when I watch that content, I think John does too, and I think, I mean, hell, that's why we went on our elk hunt in Idaho was because John's like, these guys from Born and Raised, they're out there doing that. Like, we can do that. We can do that. Sure. I think that, like, um, I, I, I don't it's, – it, it has to be, like, in the context of this – conversation and in, in speaking with you because I, can, I I have no leg to stand on but the lack of production value that they have versus like uh, one of the things like you you talked about uh, on one of your podcasts like the black rifle guys and they have a whole team and everything is produced and all this content is that the hunting public and the, the born and raised guys make you think that you can just make that same thing because it's like so shot in such a haphazard type way Blair Witch style yeah like <laughs> like you oh it's Blair Witch for sure <laughs> but you think that you could that you could do that like it seems attainable now when I watch yep. the drone shots and all of the color grading and the you know like you said all the pretty shots and the music and all the everything now it reads more like a film every episode is like a film but it's like like so were you at the ATA show last year Yep. Okay, so at the Badlands Film Festival, there was the dude who had this film that he shot in the UP of Michigan. He didn't kill anything, and it was him and his daughter, and they were painting pumpkins, and he was um, out there. And then there was, like, the fly-in helicopter hunt in Alaska where they had, like, the most epic, like kill shot I've ever seen. The arrow was seemed like it was in flight for like 90 minutes. <laughs> and then blood's going everywhere and then the helicopters come in and they've got like a drone shot showing the helicopter. Like that shit is not attainable for anybody. I was thinking about like the budget between those those two. Those two. Like the difference in like one got a lot more votes than the other did. And you know, there was a reason for that. And so I think it's that like production value is like it it is so much more epic to see but on some level you're like i can't i can't can't. it's it doesn't it's not some way average guy for the average it's not all that inspirational it's like maybe aspirational (laughs) but it's like not like fuck i can't do that you know (laughs) no i completely understand what you're saying i think that's why the whole television um i think that's why the whole television thing has gone downhill you know and, I, and it still is i haven't done tell i mean we do a little freelance work in television but we i haven't done a television show in almost three years um everything i do is web now and i honestly don't know if i ever cared to do another television show ever again just because of what you're saying um the, it none, none of what they're doing is relatable anymore um the hunts they're going on the animals they're killing you know for somebody looking in you know if somebody that's never hunted that doesn't understand it they watch they go and watch, you know, a couple episodes of a television show now. They would think that if they went and bought a bow, they should be able to go in the woods and then within 30 minutes kill a 180. Right. Well, that's not how it works. Um, and we've not done a good job of showing that. But the sponsors are to blame for a lot of that. They've made it to where if it's not over the top, if it's not hawking products, if they're not showing that this bow, this gun, this cartridge, this whatever – it's killing stuff and it's killing big stuff, then it's kind of the, um, kind of goes back to the theory of, uh, perception is reality. You know, if you're perceived and, you know, it's, and it's worked really well for Yeti, it's worked really well for Apple, it's worked really well for some big companies is if you don't buy this, then you're not cool. If you don't do this, then you're not cool. If you don't own this cooler, then nobody's going to be your friend. If you don't have the iPhone, nobody wants to hang around you because who has a Samsung anymore? You know, it's it's that whole perception is reality. If you are perceived to be bigger and larger and meaner and faster and better than, than you are, well, then you are because that's what the per- perception is. Um, and I think that's that's where a lot of uh, a lot of TV shows and content creators have lost um, touch with things. And I produce stuff that I'm not a huge fan of, but I'm doing what the client wants to do. Um if it were up to me and I was producing exactly what I wanted to produce, it would be a extremely blue collar show that was very, you know, it would be more of a comedy than anything. 
Um, it would not be PG-13. It would be something that would have to be on HBO. But it would be one of those things to where it would be extremely relatable. But it would have production value. It would be shot extremely well. It would be produced well. It would be lit well. It would be shot on good cameras. Because that's who I am. Um, but what you're saying is that that's not attainable. I, I, I agree and I disagree. Because I was exactly where you are at one point. And... It all depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to make money doing this, then it is attainable because I did it. It's possible, um, you know. And I'm just I'm a freaking redneck from Dahlonega. Um, But if that's not what your goal is, then it's not attainable. You know, it, it's like it kind of even goes back to like Lee Lee uh, Lee Likoski's story, where people always tell him all the time, you know, man, it must be nice. You know, if I had all that property in Iowa, I could kill big deer too and have a hunting show. Well. He went into foreclosure on a house in Minnesota, pretty much lost everything to do what he's doing. And now look at him. He's making tons of money getting to do exactly what he wants. But he didn't, nobody handed him anything. You know, it all comes to what, it all goes back to what that goal is. You know, what's your, what's your, uh, what's your goal? And then set out to make that goal. Um, and as far as the films going with Badlands, yeah, I wasn't very impressed with any of them. I don't, I don't guess y'all listened to that podcast where I kind of, May or, may or may not have went on a little rant about the Badlands Film Festival. <laughs> no, I didn't catch that one. Otherwise, I definitely would have uh, had more to say. Because, uh, like I said, yeah. we we were there, and like we the, the last year was our second year at ATA, and we didn't catch the Badlands the first year. And um, you know, there was I, I don't know. It, well, I got there late, so I only seen <laughs> like half the last couple, but. <laughs> But like I say, it, there there was so much. Um, I don't I don't know the word like a diversity or like, like the levels of them were like it was Both like all over. Spec. Yeah, it was all over the board, and um, you know on on some level like the people that you expected to win were gonna win. I mean, nobody was gonna vote against a kid. You, you know, a sto- oh yeah, a story no about a kid. That's what's good. <laughs> That's what's going to win every time. That's always going to win. I was talking to Ryer about that the other day. That is the story, the good, the good story, the heart, you know, the heartstring story. That's going to win every single time. And there was two of them. You're not going <laughs> to, yeah, you're not going to compete with the heartstring story. I don't care how good your production is. I don't care how big an animal you kill. You're not going to compete with a heartstring story. So we're we are still trying to figure out whether or not we're going to do one. I really badly want to. But we are so freaking backed up with edits right now that I need to get out. That if we get caught up, we're going to do one. We have two in mind. I haven't decided which version we're going to do yet. One of them will be pretty down the middle. It will, you know, it'll be an elk hunt that we did this year that we didn't kill anything. Um, And then the other one will be, let's just say it'll be a comedy. (laughs) And that's all I'm going to, that's all I'm going to say. I don't, but I'm not committing to anything as badly as I want to do one. Um, but the the problem is it's the same people that enter them every year, and uh, and they to me in my opinion they all look the same. Like you said, they were so diverse. To me, they were virtually all the same. To me, I mean, they were all the same speed. They were all the same tempo. They were all the same sound. They were all the same look. They were all the same style, um, with the exception of maybe one or two, and. <sighs> I mean, none of them were produced very good. <laughs> um, I mean, there were some of them, like some of them. I think they were they they didn't they didn't have much of a budget. Which if you don't have a budget to do stuff, I mean, it, there, there's only so much you can do. Um, but to be a film festival, n- not very many of them felt filmy to me. Um, they felt like I don't know. I'm not gonna get into that because. <laughs> I mean, I've got friends. I've got friends that had, you know, some in them last year, and I think, like I said, there was a couple of them that were good, um, but there were a couple of them that were really bad. <laughs> so uh, on on that note, uh, y- you talked about entering films into the Badlands Film Festival. John and I went on an elk hunt um, last year to Idaho, and uh, you know, we didn't shoot anything. We tried to do a little bit of video but the but there's just the two of us and it just it just didn't happen it was you know our that was fun wasn't it <laughs> that was fun trying to hike up and down the mountain trying to film an elk hunt. well it it just ended up being like you know 
we'd never elk hunted before. We didn't have a guide. We didn't have. We it was just he and I and uh, we, some we jumped YouTube in with videos both feet. And, <laughs> and and um and we got on some elk and had you know, I mean, a, an encounter with a bull. So um, I was I was telling John, or I I think I was telling John. I know I was telling my wife. So on the hunt with uh, Dudley and Rogan and everybody in Utah there, um, the second bull that was in on that watering hole that wasn't that super wide herd bull, but that really big one, um, that was the size of the bull that John called in for me. And, uh, you know, we're on public land. And I was trying to explain it to, like, everybody. I'm like, I don't – we called in a spike – we called in a raghorn, and then we called in this freaking monster dinosaur screaming giant, uh, you know, for a guy that's never, you know, seen an elk in real life prior to the spike that we called in, you know, the fifth day that we were hunting. And uh, that was the first time that I saw one that I could, like, equate it to that I was like, okay, that's that's the same size because that, that first one that, you know, was on that hunt for Dudley was huge. Uh, but I want to get into that in a second, but. And so we went out there and, you know, we didn't run it. We, we were in a low elk area. We didn't run into a single other hunter. Um, and we had, good Lord, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you're, you're, you went out to Idaho and actually got to hunt and film. And it was with the intention of producing a, a film for the Badlands Film Festival. So, um, mm. I've talked to some other people that are like, man, we should do a, 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 a film for the Badlands Film Festival, and I'm like, first of all, kind of like what you had said earlier, um, and I don't know if it was while we were recording or not, but it's not uh, hunting. You're not filming hunting. You're creating a hunt, a film that just happens to be about hunting or that in, involves hunting. Yeah. yeah. What is? What are the like requirements to like submit something? What do they want? What are the expectations? And just to touch on something else that you had um, said there, like everything kind of like felt the same or had the same tone, had the same tempo. Do you think that's because of things that have won in years past or like their expectation? I think it's the only thing people know how to do. Okay. Um, I think it's the only way. I mean, people are film people. People are trying to be Heartland bow hunter. They're trying to be you know the the three or four really cinematic, epic feeling things that are out there. They're just trying to imitate those. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but people aren't being themselves in them. They're trying to be what people want, what people think they want them to be versus what they should be. Um, and that's exactly the, the, what you should be is who you are. Um, you should learn from other pieces of content. You should see things that you like and try and emulate them, but do them in your style, your fashion. Don't try and do them the way that someone else does them. <laughs> um, don't do the long montages with voiceover. Like every film I've ever watched ever in the hunting industry, they're all the same. And they drive me insane. And as soon as I see them, I freaking turn them off because I just can't take it. I've seen too many of them. And that goes to some of the biggest budget ones I've ever watched. Their interviews or their voiceover. Just and I tell I challenge guys if you're going to go out and pe- create a piece of content for Badlands, do the entire thing and don't have the first interview, don't have the first piece of voiceover. Um, and we filmed our entire one in Idaho it, this year. Um, and if we were if we're going to use it, there won't be the first bit of voiceover. There won't be the first interview in it because we did a good job of creating content in the field. Did we get on elk? No. We ran into 11 sets of hunters in five days. We ran into 33 human beings in five days. And that's going to be the story if we tell it, is all these people that are saying that hunting numbers are down, we're not seeing it. <laughs> There's freaking people everywhere. And um, it was one of those things to where um, we just we did a good job of pre-production, of planning and shooting, and, and you know we got super frustrated with just the situation that we were in. And we didn't get some of the things that we would like to have gotten because um, of some, you know, some scenarios that were out of our control. Like we uh, we got stranded on the mountain one night, ran out of food and water, had a grizzly bear come into our camp. It was it was a fun time, <laughs> and um, we didn't we didn't do a good job of producing that because dude, we were so exhausted, we were so tired. We just we and we and and we were trying we were trying to get to sleep. 
and then had a freaking grizzly bear come in and we're like, well, we're not sleeping now. So it's like, you know, we were just burnt. Um, and there's certain situations that happened to where we just didn't get to do some things we'd like to. So that's kind of why we're reluctant to do that one. But at the same time, I kind of want to do it because we never get an elk on camera. We call in one bull the second morning. It didn't get him on camera because I dropped back to drop back to call and the guy running Ryer was running camera for Jamie. They went up to get in position to shoot. The elk came in. They couldn't get in position in time. He saw him setting up and ran off. So we never actually get a freaking elk in frame. And I wanted to tell a story, a whole story around that and see if people enjoy it and never see an elk the whole time. So that's that's kind of why we're debating on that one or not. But uh, I don't even remember what your question was. I'm rambling now. <laughs> no, I wanted to know. I wanted to hear about that hunt um, because of, you know, you were filming on that hunt with, you said uh, with the Lee Lukoski, the words must be nice, uh, you know. Oh Cam yeah, Cam Haynes goes on the J- the Joe Rogan podcast with a shirt on that says "Must be nice" because of the the oh, hunt yeah. that you were filming there. So there aren't many people, you know. There, there's a lot of people that are going to be able to relate to the hunt that you just outlined there, where you went and you called in one elk, you called in eleven sets of hunters, you know, everything went to shit real fast and. Oh, very, very you know, fast, yes. And and that was with all of your pre-production. And if that amount of pre-production went into the videoing aspect of it, the hunt, the the planning that went into that had to have been, you know, just as much or greater. Um, and then mm-hmm. expectation versus reality. And then contrast that to what you ran into when you went to, to this must-be-nice hunt. So can you kind of give a little background oh, on God. where that was, what that was, and then the the experiences that you had there? So, yeah, to contrast, Idaho, we drove we drove from Georgia to Idaho to film that uh Badlands film. We did a lot of a lot of work on pre-production of what we wanted to film, some of the things we wanted to hit on, talk about, some of the dialogue we wanted to get, shots we wanted to get all those things and and then we were going to let the ha- ha- we were going to let the hunt kind of happen. And then produce the things that happened, and that's what we did. And uh, I think we did a good job of it, and then we didn't kill an elk. And I was kind of really wanting to, you know, because the story is about two Georgia buddies that go to Idaho to try and kill an elk and uh, had a specific idea in mind of how we wanted to film it, and we did, and we didn't kill an elk. And, uh, you know, that was kind of frustrating. And I literally left straight from that trip where I called in 33 people in five days and I went to a gigantic private ranch with Dudley and Andy Stump and Joe Rogan and Jocko and um, I think Scott Eastwood was in camp uh, Cameron Haynes was in camp uh, Levi Morgan was in camp there's there's the who's who of freaking archery hunting was there and um, and this place was a zoo I mean think about I don't even know how to describe it. Um, the film that I did for Andy is going to be coming out here pretty soon. It's finally finished. Um, now I'm just waiting on Black Rifle to get through Black, you know, Black Friday and Thanksgiving and everything before they can approve it and get it going and everything. But I mean, you can't, you couldn't count the bugles. You couldn't. We we spooked off more elk than. Like, if it wasn't an elk they wanted to shoot, they didn't even care. They didn't care about the wind. They didn't care about anything. They just walk right by them, and the elk would just run off and run up the hill and look at you. And I'm like, holy crap at the amount of freaking elk at this place. Um, and it was it's extremely well managed. It's well taken care of. And, and But the, the, the hard part, and you think, well, man, that sounds awesome. That sounds like a really easy hunt. It wasn't an easy hunt because of how many elk there are. And how strictly managed it is, you have to find a specific elk. And once you find that elk, you have to get close enough to kill it with a bow. And it wasn't easy. Um, if we were just there to kill an elk, it would have been the easiest hunt of all time. But um, we had to, you know, we had to kill an elk that was eight years or older. You know, certain, you know, had certain characteristics, and uh, you had a guide that told you whether or not you could shoot. And the terrain wasn't wasn't easy. I mean, it wasn't the hardest terrain I've ever been in, but. Um, as far as animal interactions and that story wrote itself 
because you just got there and you just rolled on those elk and you got reactions from your hunter as what is going on like what in god's name is happening at this current moment and it's we can't hear ourselves think because there are elk screaming like fire breathing dragons all around us and we don't know which direction to go because they're everywhere and they're running cows and they're running like madmen around this canyon and we don't know what to do now um and that's essentially what happened and everybody there you know which i think andy and i had the the craziest experience because everybody else was in elk but not like us holy crap at the elk I'm, i mean i had done before i ever laid hands on an elk i did 11 elk hunts 11 different um trips for elk some of them were public land some of them some of them were private ranches before i ever laid hands on an elk um and that was on my own elk that I killed on public land in Colorado in 2017. Since then, we've killed more elk. But, I, I mean, I, I can't... Every elk hunt I've ever done with a 20 or 30x on them, I saw more elk and heard more bugles the first afternoon in Utah with, with Andy and Dudley and them than I did on all those other hunts. I mean, it was dumb. <laughs> And a, a normal person, uh, that's unattainable. So how how did oh, you, yeah, how did sure. you feel like personally, f- you know, going from one to the other? Because I mean, is it that must be nice? Is is there like resentment? It, I mean, is that warranted or uh, you know what I mean? Like like for these guys, you know, to show up and they're the who's who of bow hunting, but they're in. Uh, a situation like that versus two buddies from Georgia trying to go kill an yeah. elk in I- any elk in Idaho. Well, and I think Dudley said it the best because me and him kind of had this conversation. He's like, dude, he's like, do you know how many freaking public land hunts that I did where I got my butt kicked for years and for 25 years? He's like, it's taken me 25 years to get to this place. It's taken me 25 years to get to the place where I get invited on a hunt like this. Because that's the only way you get to go to there, is you get invited. Um, and it's one of those things to where all those guys that were there pretty much had paid their dues in one way or the other. You know, m- maybe not hunting dues, but they pay their dues in other ways. Um, and as a, you know, a 32-year-old guy, I've not paid dues to go to a place like that. And I think most guys that are out hunting public land, they have it. Um, not, not unless they've been doing it for 20 something years like Dudley. You know, Dudley's just now starting to get to go and do some of these hunts. Dude, he is a freaking grinder. He is a guy that he, he'll go anywhere and hunt anything with anybody, and he's going to bring stuff back before most guys. Well, I don't care where it's at. Um, and he, it was, it was kind of, I think it was, I, I, he didn't say this, but I think it was almost awkward for him because it was, it's a different world. Um, but he is also, I mean, I've done, I mean, we, I went on a public land hunt with him in Montana last year, and we killed an elk. Um, they killed three elk in three and a half days because I was there for four days, and we had killed one, and then I left, and then the next two and a half days they killed two more on public land in Montana. And But that's because we did like 14 miles a day, and he's an animal. Um, it didn't have anything to do with the place we were. Um, and, and for people that, that have that, that you know, must be nice – I think everybody has a little bit of that, and I don't think you're ever going to get rid of that, but I think most people that say that don't take the whole thing into account. Um, They've only seen that snapshot of that elk hunt that was epic. They didn't see all the other crap that, that especially, you know, speaking for Dudley, especially what he does and all the free information he gives away and all the things that he does for the hunting community and all the dues he's paid over the 30, you know, 25, 30 years that's what people don't take into account. So when people say that, it, it doesn't, I don't think it bothers, it doesn't bother me. And, and and my whole thought when I was there was, I'm the luckiest dude in the world to get to experience this. And I would much rather be holding the camera than the bow right now because I know what's riding on that arrow <laughs> if you screw up here. Um, and it was one of those things where the pressure is kind of off of me. I say it's, it's never off of me, but on that trip it was because that's an expensive hunt if you screw something up. And um, I didn't want to be the guy to screw something up. Well, like I said to you, like I sent over the show notes and like all that, like I don't think that there's too many people that 
can even like fathom that that sort of transition, right? So, you know, that would have been like John and I going on our hunt, you know, doing our thing, and we didn't have nearly the time that you did in Idaho with other hunters and 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 all that. Like that would have been just like man, I don't know if I'd ever want to do this again. <laughs> oh, trust me, I questioned it many times on this last but trip. But then driving, instead of going home, just going to film, you know, yeah, like the archery superstars, the, you know, the Mount Rushmore of archery, you know, this day and age. <laughs> the Mount Rushmore, that's a good way <laughs> right. of saying it, Mount and then, Rushmore. In, you, in Elk Paradise. Right. And then you're the guy with the camera going like, I just got – my dick kicked in, you know, for five days, oh, and God. now I get to watch you guys hoot and holler and do all yeah. this. So that 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 perspective is, you know, very interesting. And it, I mean, I think it says a lot for, you know, both your character as a person, but like as a like professional or like you said, you wanted to get into this just to do, just to be put in that position. Yeah, just to get to experience that. Because I got the first thing I did when I got home is I told my dad about it. I'm like, Dad, you ain't gonna believe this crap. <laughs> <laughs> and and I told my I told my brother and I told my dad and I told my buddies. I'm like, I mean, this place is this place was a zoo. I mean, it was freaking crazy. All you know, just young bulls running like freaking mad. Um, but it was awesome. You know, it was it was it was. And it's what I needed after getting my dick kicked in for five <laughs> days. You know, I was like, "This is what an this is what an elk sounds like. This is what an elk looks like." I forgot what they looked like. It sounded like, um, you know. But it was, you know, it is frustrating. You know, I've I've done, you know, the last two years I was in Wyoming last year on an elk hunt on a, a actually a general unit tag that I drew and I ran into a bunch of hunters and didn't see very many elk. And then this year the same thing. Um, it's frustrating. Public land hunting period is frustrating, but like I've had so many conversations with guys here um, around Georgia that think hunting here is great, and there's no worse place on <laughs> earth to hunt than freaking North Georgia. I'll just tell you. Um, and the and these guys around here love it. They're so passionate about whitetail hunting and turkey hunting and just freaking stoked out of their mind to shoot a 110-inch whitetail. And I'm like, guys, y'all have got to go do something else somewhere else. Because if you love it here, you are going to die if you go anywhere else. I was like, you need to go out west. And they're like, well, you know, you know, most guys aren't very successful on their first elk hunt. I'm like, yeah, but if you're going out there to be successful, and that's the only reason you're going, then you're going for the wrong reasons anyway. Right. Um, you know, just to experience being out west, just to experience to hear an elk bugle in the distance, just to be in the mountains. You know, to me, that's worth the price of admission right there. And I tell guys that all the time is if you do one thing in your life, you need to go the last two weeks of September, buy an over-the-counter elk tag, and go run around in the mountains and compete with everybody else just to, just to tell your grandkids that you did it. Because I promise you, if you do it one time, you're going you're gonna to find a reason to go every year. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely, I mean, when we set out, our, I mean, our, our listeners have heard this story multiple times, but, you know, our goal was to hear an elk, see an elk, and get an opportunity at elk. You know, that was that was our goals. You know, if we killed one, that would be awesome. And and when we said kill one, I mean, anything went. I mean, our tag was good for cow, Any spike, elk. you know, whatever. So if it was brown, basically, it was going to be down <laughs> or tan. But <laughs> So we got out there, and they like said the first, first one we, you know, we finally heard a bugle look down and here's a little spike and you know i mean we were both we did a little interview afterwards and we were like i mean i had a yard sale i was like emptying my pack getting out the decoy and and it, it, we ended up getting winded but and then the, you know come down to the second to last day ended up calling that i mean just a you know a beautiful big bull and we had a screaming match you know it was like 45 minutes at least of pure interaction between him and I just calling at each other you know and he would cut me off and I would cut him off and if you had a video of me I mean at the end I was like black from all the because we were in the burn black and I was bloody from raking and busting my knuckles on trees and the veins were sticking out of my forehead and neck from screaming and <laughs> I mean just that opportunity or just that experience was worth the whole trip for me 
Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Just seeing that bull oh, probably worth a whole yeah, trip. Yeah, I mean, just seeing I was like, holy shit. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's a big bull. In the words of Andy Stumpf, he didn't know those majestic forest beasts even existed <laughs> until recently. Oh, uh, it was like un freaking believable and uh, you know i don't know if we like i i don't i don't know how difficult it is i'm sure that it is but like i feel i feel like you know that it's really something for us to go out there you know the and we were out there the day after the opener so we weren't out there for oh y'all are for the early. rut um yeah that's awesome and then to, you know we called in three three bulls and you know, had an opportunity at two of them, ba- right. basically. I mean, I, that big one, I definitely, I mean, I, I, John would have shot him. I, I I couldn't make the shot. It was, I, I could make a 60, it was 62 yards. I could make the shot, but I was standing on a deadfall trying to shoot through a window and I wasn't comfortable seven miles from the truck doing that. And, you know, John would have did it all day long. We were six miles from the truck on the last day hiking back and I could have shot, a hundred and ten inch white tail, yeah, and uh, oh, I, nice. but I didn't do that because it, we were six miles from the truck, and I was like, well, if I he was bedded down, and I was like, well, if I can make a bad shot or whatever, um, but we got a lesson in filming in that one because of shakiness and like the whole yeah, I was trying to film stock, and I think I actually can hear it because when we were we were walking back down the old logging road and we spotted this buck and it was like 52 or 54 yards from, you know, and it would have been, it was like a total archery challenge shot. I mean, I mean like off, like pulled right from the books, a total archery challenge. I'm like put a bunch of shit in the way, bedded down behind yeah. this thing. But you could have got an arrow through there. I mean, and so he's like, I'm going to put a stock in on it. So I'm like, just get down below it. Like right here, and you'll have, you know, there was like one limb that was kind of about 20 yards out. That would have been, you know, at our height, because we're, he was downhill of us. It would have been a problem. But as soon as he dropped down off the edge of the old logging road, I'm like, you would have had a clear shot at about, you know, 42. Well, he gets down to what you got to like 35. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, just move over. I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> you know, I'll shoot him from here. And uh, he ended up, like, losing his balance on a uh, deadfall and just kind of fell down, broke a twig, and then finally the deer got up and took off. I'm like, what? Why didn't you shoot him? <laughs> He's like, well, we're six months. I'm like, dude, it's the last day. <laughs> I mean, it's a whitetail. Yeah. We're going to pack out a freaking, you know, huge elk. <laughs> Who cares about a little whitetail? We can cut that thing in half. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but. But yeah, I mean, like, like I say, like for us to go out there and do that, like, I, I don't know how hard it is or, I mean, I, I, I think we did a great job. I, I'm sure, I know that it's a feat, but you know, I feel like if two and, idiots from Michigan can do it. We, we average 13 <laughs> miles a day, you yeah. know, on our, yeah. yeah. That ain't no joke, man. That's no joke on flat ground, much less. <laughs> oh yeah. Ground. I was, uh, uh, our listeners heard this story too, but every night on the way back, I had the wrong boots. I mean, I had my crispy Thors, but. They were, those are like a mountain man's boot. If you got, that'd be oh, like wearing, you know, I've compared it. I used to play hockey. That'd be like putting someone on skates for the first time, tell them to go play hockey in, in a set of figure skates, basically, you know, because your ankles aren't strong. Well, those are awesome boots, but there's like no ankle support. So after no, going, no, after not. going 12, 13 miles in the mountains, then coming back down any little stone or, you know, I would step down and my ankle would just roll. <laughs> to me, I, I bought those same boots because those are the ones Dudley had, and he loved them. And I bought them, and I felt like I, the ankle support was bad for me because I got a, my right ankle all torn ligaments in it twice. But dude, those are like standing on two by fours. They had no cushion in the in the foot, the sole of them at all, and they killed my feet. Yeah. And I uh, I went back to my Solomon's. Oh my gosh, I'll never. I, I cheated on my Solomons with Krispies, <laughs> and um, I will never do it again because I put my Chris or my Solomons back on when I got home, and I bought three pairs since then. And I'll never do it See, again. See, that's what I originally had the Solomons on my list. They were like the GTXs. Yep. Well, and I gave the Krispies to Ryer because I told him I didn't like them because they were I had worn them like two or three trips and hated them. Gave them to him, and he loves them. Yeah. 
he wore them to Idaho and walked, you know, 10, 12 miles a day in them, and he freaking loves them. So I think it's just either I've got sissy feet or I think it's just a foot thing to where, you know, it just fit his foot better than mine or whatever. Yeah, I'd, see, I put – I have a pair of, like, custom orthotics that I had made years ago, and so I put those – at first it was the same thing. It was really – they're real stiff, and, it, you know, they hurt my feet a little bit. You know, but then I put my custom orthotics in it, and they they fit better. But it was like shit, just no support for. You know, I haven't played hockey now in ten years, and I got pretty weak ankles. And coming down that hill after, you know, ten, twelve, thirteen miles, man, that was between your ankles and your knees. Then that's when everything goes yep. south. But so, uh, for you. You know what? What's the most fun and or then the most difficult animals to to film, like for yourself? Oh, elk! Elk's the most fun and the most difficult for <laughs> okay. sure. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. But it's also my favorite. Um, it's one of those things to where if I could give, if I could only pick one thing to hunt and or film for the rest of my life, it's elk. Um, it kicks my butt every year um, because I'm never in as good a shape as I need to be. Um, but there's just something about an elk, the romance of the West. It's hard to make them not beautiful. Um, if the elk are cooperating, there's nothing more fun. Um, I, the, the, the worst part about elk hunting for me and the hardest part about elk hunting for me is the two things is the terrain and the physicality of it is really tough but it's also extremely rewarding. And the other is it's always in September and the days are so long and the nights are so short. You just never get fully rested. So you're just at the end of September. I'm a zombie. Like this year I left September the 5th and I was gone until September the 28th. I was gone the whole time elk hunting the entire time. I got in my truck the 28th on the end of that Utah hunt. No, it was the 29th. I drove all the way home from Utah and I was home for a day and a half and then I left to go to Moose Camp in British Columbia with Dudley and I was straight from there to go to Alberta to Whitetail Hunt with Brian, another client of mine. So I had a day and a half gap after essentially almost 25 days of elk hunting and dude, I was so burnt oh my gosh, I was so burnt and so tired and just running on fumes. And then we get to moose camp and then you're up north and you have, the days are even shorter. And, then, uh, you know, that didn't help. Um, so it just it's one of those things to where it's, it's such a long day. It's such a hard physical day. But just being out west and being in elk camp, it's so rewarding. Um, I freaking love it and I, can, and I cannot wait to have my soul taken again next year because it's going to happen. <laughs> so the, the next question, and I don't want to keep you too much longer here, uh, but I got like two more questions for you. <clears throat> but, You're good, man. But this one, um, since you brought it up, I, I feel like this may, the, the Alberta hunt may be the answer, uh, but what's been the most difficult hunt that you've had or um, like any sort of adversity as the the producer the the you know running the camera or, or doing any of that because it seems like you guys ran into some adversity with the great flu virus of 2019 in, oh, in alberta you, okay you're, so you're talking about that alberta trip <laughs> okay now that alberta trip was easy for me that I, i'm the only person in camp that didn't get sick every other person i mean dudley and andy were on the verge of death like not not even kidding <laughs> Now, I felt so bad for them, I did not film any of it. And I told, and Dudley asked me afterwards if I filmed any of it, because Dudley came out there and talked to us a couple of times and doesn't remember it. <laughs> like, he was so gone, he doesn't remember talking to us. And uh, he asked me if I'd filmed any of it, because he couldn't remember it. And I was like, dude, I felt so bad, I didn't. He's like, oh, man, you should have. That would been good. <laughs> I was like, well, I was like, I was like, dude, I felt so bad. I, Andy didn't get out of the bed for 18 hours. Like, no lie. I drove to town twice to get them fluids. They were so sick. Um, I mean, like, death warmed over. Andy said at one point he was sitting in the tub 
pissing and throwing up at the same time and while the hot water ran on him. He's like, dude, I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> he's, he, I think he said he, he threw up and dry heaved 30-something times in like a couple of hours. And he's, I mean, the dude's a freaking 17-year Navy SEAL, and he said it's the worst he's ever felt. And I'm like, dude, that's not good. <laughs> but no, but for me, that one was a cakewalk. The hardest trip I've ever been on, bar none, is Alaska in 2017. Uh, I did a brown bear hunt in Alaska. Um, we got there end of September because we left October the 5th so it was like it was 15 days so whatever 15 days before October the 5th is when we got there and uh, it wasn't supposed to be 15 days it was supposed to be 13 days and I'll get into that in a minute but um, we get to Cordova, Alaska and then we fly uh, we fly a bush plane into our remote camp which is on the coast of southeast Alaska for a brown bear hunt and I'd never done a brown bear hunt to this point and I've never done another one and I don't ever care to do another <laughs> one again um, but uh, essentially we were there on a rifle hunt we had uh, two clients that two bear tags and um, we get there and the first day we get there the weather's not that bad you know it's like 50 degrees winds blowing you know 10 or 15 miles an hour I was like oh you know I can live with this well dude we, we get to like the safety meeting that first day for this hunt because you know brown bear there's going to be some sort of safety meeting and find out that we're going to be required to wear chest waders all day every day the whole time we're gone and i'm thinking i've got to wear freaking chest waders and run a camera and wa- walk around in sloppy crap all day every day i was like oh this is gonna suck but you know what I'm, i'll be okay well wasn't okay um essentially we were hunting on a giant sponge that was soaking wet all the time. Um, we would stand on the bank of the river after riding in a 14-foot John boat that we had to get out and push half the time because we couldn't get over the rocks because the river was so low. We would get to this spot in the river, and we would stand on the bank of the river over a, over a kill site waiting on a bear to come in for 14 hours. While we're standing, it is generally 40 degrees or, or lower, which isn't that cold, but the wind is blowing sideways, and it is raining the entire time. The the worst conditions I've ever tried to film in in my entire life. The fifth or fourth or fifth day, I got a migraine on the bank of the river, and literally just sat down and like crossed my arms and closed my eyes. And the guy that I was filming like took a picture of me, and I've kept that picture because I was like that's the lowest I've ever been right <laughs> Rock there. Rock bottom. And that was the fourth or that. That was the fourth or fifth day of that trip. And it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't that it was physically hard. It was just the mental. Like, I want to blow my brains out right now. This is miserable. And um, we saw the sun one time in 15 days. Um, That's the only time in my career that I've had to tell a client I'm not taking my cameras out in that weather. It was blowing 40 miles an hour sustained with 70 mile an hour gusts. And it was raining. And it was like 35 degrees. And they're like, we're going hunting. I'm like, y'all have fun. I'll be right here. <laughs> I was going to say, how, how the hell do you even film and, uh, that? I mean, <laughs> that you don't. I was like, dude, I, I was like, I can't keep my cameras dry. It's impossible to keep them dry in this. I literally saw them go out of sight on the four wheelers and come right back. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I thought, you all idiots. <laughs> and it was just, it was just this old pimp guy that thought that he was just, Billy badass so he decided that he was going to go out in any conditions imaginable and I'm telling you every time the wind was blowing that hard nothing was out nothing moved which that's I mean let's be honest if if the wind's blowing that hard for whitetails nothing's going to move they don't want to move and stuff like that they don't like it any more than we do and so we would go out in this crap and we're wasting our time I'm like this is so stupid and to top it all off we were at this camp in the middle of nowhere and the cooking camp was a French chef and he cooked the weirdest <laughs> food that was disgusting <laughs> the entire time. I like It was like five or six days in, I'm like, dude, can we have a cheeseburger or like a pizza? And he's like, he looked, he was offended that I even asked him. It was the worst trip ever. Good God, I don't ever want to go back to that place again. So he was no Dudley as a cook? 
Oh my gosh, Dudley. That's half the reason I work with Dudley, is he's such a good cook. So you said it was supposed to be 13 days and it was 15. Oh, forgot to tell you. So we got there. The, so the first client killed. He killed on the fifth day. Um, he killed a bear on the fifth day. And so the other client, I'm now going to go with him for the next, you know, he killed early. And we were going to keep hunting. And to this point, the the, the outfitter was 100% on bears. He had never not had a client kill a bear. Well, we get all the way to the 13th day, and we haven't killed a bear for the second client. And uh, we're supposed to fly out, and we are ready to go. The client that hadn't killed a bear, he's ready to go. He's like, yeah, I want out of this place. This is miserable. Well, the guide did not want that one guy not killing a bear on his record. And the weather was bad, but it wasn't nothing like most of the time. I mean, it was pretty mild. And uh, he, he comes in there and tells us, we get all of our gear packed up, completely packed, sitting next to the bush plane, like waiting to go. He comes in there and gets us. He's like, we missed our weather window. We're like, what? He's like, yeah, we, were, we, we should have left 10 minutes ago. We're like, well, we've been in here for 30 minutes waiting on you. We've been ready to go. And essentially what we suspect, I don't know this for sure, he did not want to not have a kill on his record. So we got weathered in for two more days. So we had to go back to our rooms, unpack our crap, and deal with that place for two more days and still didn't kill a bear and finally got to fly out two days later. I told, I called my wife and I was like, baby, I may, I may die here. <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm never going to get to leave this place. It was a Hotel oh, California, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, dude, it was bad. So, I mean, there's a lot in there that's, like, inspirational, like when you said said about, like, Lee Likoski, and you know, he said, well, you know, I don't, I, I, I can't kind of get behind that. If you, if you can't see the inspiration in that or if it's not attainable, you know, I did it, like, you can do it too. Right. Even if you listen to Dudley's backstories, you know, he – started out in uh, Wisconsin with like 10 acres and you know he ended up leaving Matthews and he I mean took like his life savings or whatever and went on that trip and killed some you know animals like in a 30-day trip but he's like I didn't chew I didn't you know guys go out and chew chew tobacco and buy alcohol and do this he's I'd save throughout the year to to go on these trips and it's got him to where he's at yep so so there's there's, there's yep. a ton that's inspirational in there, and, like, it, it it really is. So what would you say to guys, like, as you're, like, parting shot that are, like, trying to, you know, create better content, trying to move up, trying to, you know, that aspire to be this? Because it, it's twofold, and, it, you know, y- your character, like I said, by doing the podcast and trying to, like, elevate guys and trying to help people out because you didn't have that um, kind of says a lot because a lot of people, I think, with like YouTube and like all of these, you know, you get one viral video and then you get a million followers and then, you know, everything like blows up and it seems like it should be so easy. Um, what yeah. do you have uh, as far as like your, your one thing, your big, um, you know, tips or whatever for the, the self filmer field producer, you know, the guy trying to elevate their, their content. <sighs> I don't know if I can narrow it down to one thing. Um, I think that the one thing that I think uh, that's important is kind of stay true to yourself. And, and that sounds super cliche, but don't try and be what people think you should be. You know, like what the born and raised guys did to that point, nobody had ever done that before. That's why they were successful. Uh, they stayed true to what they were doing with their group of guys. And they did something that was who they are. And they stayed true to that. Same thing with the hunting public guys. Um, same thing with Lee and Tiffany. Same thing with Dudley. They, that's who those people are. Uh, that's not a facade. I've been with them. That's not fake. That is exactly who those people are. Now, are there some fake ones out there? Absolutely. But the ones that are successful, the ones that have staying power, the ones that are making money, are doing what they're good at. They're not trying to be someone else. Um, and the next thing that I can say in this industry is it goes back to doing the little things right is always answer your phone. I I mean, I have had coworkers and bosses that were like trying to catch the Easter bunny. Um, and nobody wants to work with, and everybody knows that you have your phone, 
Everybody knows you check it 57 times a day. Everybody knows you check your email. Everybody knows all this. So if you're a bad communicator, then that means to me you're very self-serving and selfish and that your time is more valuable than my time, and that's not true. That's my number one pet peeve is I'm always, I always try to make myself available um, because I don't ever want someone waiting on me. So if you're a good communicator, you stay positive, you work hard, and be and be the guy people want in camp, you will have a future. Because like I said before, if I can do this, anybody can do it. Well, that's awesome, and that's inspirational for us because, I mean, hell, John, means we got a shot, right? Yeah. <laughs> <we're> just <laughs> being who we are. I'm going to get uh, out there and start doing as much filming as possible. Maybe I can go tag along with Dudley on a hunt somewhere. <laughs> I'll do it for free. Well, good luck. He's like he's like trying to catch up with Granddaddy Longlegs. He's an ogre. He's so freaking well, tall. I'm, John and him aren't that that different. I mean, the first year we were at ATA, and you know, John, it was it, John. It was like seeing the Easter Bunny. He was like, "Fuck, there's Dudley," and they talked for hours. <laughs> I mean, like literally, like a, oh yeah, a couple of hours. Yeah. And uh, well, that was the first year. I think. I mean, he brought Andy, so when I talked to Andy for quite a while, that was right after Andy had started his. Well, that was podcast. what. Year, year ago, two years, two years, years ago, ago? Yeah, oh, two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. Dud, yeah. Dudley didn't go last year, but but yeah, I don't I don't think he's going to be there this year. I talked to him the other day, and he doesn't think he's going to get yeah. to make it. Well, but but like I say, you know, it was, you know, like I said, there's there's hope for us, John, and and it, that <laughs> seems like real simple. So, it, you know, it, if people are trying to follow along with the podcast, if they want to, um, I don't know what you guys get your services if they want if they want Hire you to come and, come and come and film you how do they how do they track you down um uh, redneck tech podcast is at redneck tech podcast on instagram and redneck tech podcast at gmail.com and then um just look up copeland creative um that's our company it's at cope creative on instagram c-o-p-e creative um and if you hit hit at me either place i'll be there um yeah pretty easy well, awesome, man. Thanks, yeah. you know, thanks for coming on and, and chatting with us. And like I said, I could talk to you for a month about all this stuff. So, yeah, man. It's well, just great. Just, I, I enjoy talking about it. So, uh, yeah, hit me up. Let me know. Um, if y'all ever come up with uh, another subject y'all want to talk about, holler at me and we'll jump back on here. Are you guys going to be at ATA show this year? Yep. Yes, we will. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, I will be there. Um, definitely there on Friday and Saturday because they're not letting media in on Thursday this year. That's so sweet of them. Oh, well, we just hustled our way in, like, because they increased the price for media. Oh, so we God, like, did, did they? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> right, so we were there last year as media, and we were like, this isn't so bad. And then this year I was like, uh, excuse yeah, me. Bad. <laughs> so we were like, uh, we'll figure out a different way in. And so, yeah, yeah. we'll be there. We'll be there on uh, our buddy's retailer, you know, we'll going in, checking out the, the retail side of it for him. He always wants us to look at new products, what he nice. put in his Nice, well, shop, good for y'all. So. Yeah, well, I'm thirteen hundred dollars into that freaking show, and I haven't even gotten there yet. So, All right? Oh, yeah, that freaking media sales badge this year about broke me. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll look definitely look forward to to meeting you up with you there. And I think that's all we got for today. So, yeah, man, holler at that's me. It. All right, all right. Later. Thanks, guys. Yep. Sit down.